All right, so we're live. We are live. Yeah. Is that snow behind you? It looks, the floor looks white. Oh, I think it's the, <laughs> it's just the camera saturation a little bit. Okay, okay. Uh, that's cool, that's cool. I can see a beautiful scenery behind you and I, that's not a, it's not a wallpaper, right? No, that is not. So uh, I'm actually in this beautiful little public park, um, not far from where I'm staying. Uh, and behind me there, you can see a bit of it. That is actually the, um, the walls of, of Constantinople, the old walls. Uh, and it runs for a few kilometers in, wow. in either direction. How old do you think that wall is? Oh, it was built during the, the time of the, the Roman Empire. So uh, probably about, I'd say well over 1,500 years old, probably close to 2,000 years old even. Okay, close to 2,000 years. I mean, look at that, right? I mean, 2,000 years old and it's still there, it's still standing. And 2,000, not 200, not 20, 2000 2000 years old it's it's incredible yeah. um and with this section behind me is a is a little bit uh, dilapidated but a little bit ahead there's these towers that jut out of the ground along this this wall there's these giant archways um, that are still standing and the cool thing about those archways is that they've been incorporated into the regular roadways so about 100 meters down there there's this road that comes off of the highway off of the main road and goes directly through one of these archways so cars coming off the highway got to drive through this 2000 year old wall to get to the residential area on on the other side sure it's, it's, it's such a contrast to the times we are living in when things are so fleeting, things are changing at such an incredibly rapid pace. And it's, it's sometimes hard to even keep up. But here you've got, you've got all of this, this, these ancient relics that have been standing there for 2,000 2, years. It, it, it's kind of a, almost a, a, a culture shock for me in my brain. It is. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I love this place so much. And the other one is, um, well, the more modern take on, on things, the, the way the country is developing uh, at the moment. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, Turkey was nothing uh, like it is today. But to, uh, today, they are, you know, the economy is growing extremely fast. Um, and technologically, they are one of the most advanced countries on, on the planet. They are capable of developing software and hardware beyond um, what, what a lot of the, you know, what, what the rest of the world is, is capable of. So it's, it's really amazing immersing yourself in here and, and seeing what, what's, what's capable. Uh, and that gives us, that gives me a bit of hope for, for South Africa back home. I mean, we are in a bit of a, of a, a challenging spot at the moment, but you, you see the progress that the Turks have made in, in just a few short years, uh, utilizing technology specifically. And you realize what's possible, you know, mm. when, when, when the people have a, a vision of what they want for the future, w w what they can achieve. And yeah, you know, I want the same thing for, for South Africa back home. Speaking of which, I believe that one of the biggest uh, aircraft carriers that was built by, by the Turks is, is parked uh, in Istanbul right now. It's docked in the Bosphorus somewhere. It is. It's called the, the TCG Anadolu. And yeah, I mean, that's just a, a testament of, of you know, what, 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 what I was saying. Um, it's a huge aircraft carrier kitted out with the most modern military technology, but it was built entirely in Turkey using local companies and, and local technologies. So it's just like this giant monument to the, the progress that they've been making. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. And I believe you're going to go and actually see it today. Yeah, I mean, it, it just launched. So they, they opened it to, to the public for, for just a few days. Uh, and coincidentally, it was right when, when, when uh, I was in town. So yes. yeah, I definitely didn't want to miss on an opportunity like that. Yeah, that'd be incredible. Okay, so today's topic is not Turkey and their technical problems. <laughs> what is today's topic? So today we're talking about something that I think IT Varsity students are going to appreciate a lot. Um, we're talking about the best app development frameworks uh, or the best HTML5 app development frameworks. Um, I mean, all of our IT Varsity students should be fairly competent with developing in HTML5. Um, so we're going to be talking about the frameworks that they can use to take their skills and their, the quality of the apps to a whole new level. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it uh, on the topic of HTML5, it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? And it's, it's the entire entrepreneur which has now been incorporated into our diploma in software engineering. So entrepreneur now becomes the first year of our, of our diploma. And there's a very, very strong emphasis on HTML5 there. And what's great about it, and I've, I've always found it great. I mean, you know, when I first started developing apps, it was in HTML5. And that was in the earliest, earliest days of HTML5, when there was no such thing as HTML5. Mm. Let's put it that way. So this was around 2011, 2012, when I started de uh, developing mobile apps. And the, the, my first app that I built, Rhythmetic, was built with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that went on to win the Vodacom App Star Award and uh, was basically what launched our, our app business. So I'm, 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 really, I'm really excited about this topic because it's a topic that's that's close to me. Topic that I really uh, I really enjoy because I have personal experience with this. In fact, the whole diploma, if you think about it, the second year of the diploma is Java full stack development, uh, or rather Java back end development, because the the front end of the full stack is done in the first year and the back end is done in the second year. I think that's very unique in in mm -hmm. the way we're approaching it. So in the first year, and I'm, I'm, I'm digressing here, but, but this is exciting, right? In the first year, students will, will use JavaScript, will use HTML5 to talk to a remote API, to an online API. It's a very simple one. It's, it's a, the contact book API, where they will, be, they will create a front-end application that actually sends information to the API and receives information from the API. So you, it's, it's, in the first year, this, this whole API is, is hidden from the student. All you're doing is you're hitting it, you're talking to it and mm -hmm. giving information. But in the second year, now we shift the camera from the front to the back end where the students actually get to see that API and not just that they will build that API themselves. And so the front end application they built in the first year will start to talk to the back end application that they built in the second year. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. I was thinking, where was it is. I university when I was a student? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the, the, the beautiful thing about these, these frameworks that we're gonna talk about today is that they facilitate that, that handshake between the, uh, the back end and the front end um, development. So al although there are HTML5 frameworks, um, you don't have to build your entire app with them. You can, build, you can build the entire app with them, or you can just build the front end things of it in HTML5 and have the framework talk directly to um, your, your back end things that you develop either in Java or whatever other language. That's actually the, the, the best practice uh, uh, these days in software engineering. When you are creating applications, the whole concept of a full stack application is outdated. You know, we used to have MVC, a model view controller, where you've got mm. the view, which is the front end talking to the back end. Though that, that, that framework is, is not, it's still being used, 
I won't say it's obsolete, but it's not ideal. Now there's a clear separation. You don't build full stack applications any longer. You build APIs, maybe a RESTful API, which sits there, and then you build your front end applications. So that could mm. be a mobile app, could be a web uh, website, but it talks to the API using JavaScript's fetch API, which IT varsity students actually learn in the first year. It's a very difficult concept to learn, but they learn it because of the importance of that, it, because of our foresight that these uh, developers are going to be, there's almost no app on earth nowadays, unless it's your calculator app that works on its own on the front end. Pretty much every mm. app in the world needs to talk to a server and they talk using these kinds of uh, kinds of fetch uh, APIs to talk to the back end. And the back end is where all the heavy lifting happens. It's where the database sits. It's where the processing happens. It's where the images are stored. So when you, for example, using a, a mobile app like TikTok, you upload your video. Your video doesn't live on your phone any longer. You know that it, it, it sits on TikTok servers. How did it get there? The mobile app talked to the back end API and sent that information. There was a handshake sent the information, after the information was sent, another handshake, done. That's how it works. Yeah, so tell us mm -hmm. about these, these frameworks. I am digressing a lot because this is my forte. This is what I love. This is my, I'm in my element right now. I, I could tell, I could tell how excited you, you're getting about this and it's making me think we should have probably split this topic into, into a few webinars to, <laughs> to give you the time needed to, to, to dive into each of these. but. Yeah, I mean, let, let's dive straight into um, uh, a framework number number one uh, on our list. And that is, I think, a pretty well-known name. All of these will be well-known names, but this one has been around for quite some time. And it is Ionic, the, the Ionic framework. <laughs> Boy, does that bring back memories. <laughs> um, was the, the Rispetic app built on, on Ionic or the, 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 the later versions? No, no, the first version was on Ionic. It was actually, okay, uh, okay. like I said, built with HTML5, mm. but uh, it was wrapped with Ionic. So let's, let's talk about Ionic, right? Um, I'm just going to open up your notes here because there are some mm. technical details that I tend to forget. Uh, so let's talk about Ionic. So Ionic is an open source framework for deploying your HTML5 apps. Now remember something, right? For 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 the uh, for the new newbies among us, um, you can't you can't deploy an HTML5 app to the app stores. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. You can deploy it to a server and then run it through the browser like a normal website, but that's about it. And that maybe also is another topic another webinar topic uh, that we should do because um, I, I noticed that the operating systems are starting to give a lot more support to those kinds of HTML5 apps that actually sit on a server, not in the app store. That's a very interesting topic on its own. Uh, nowadays, I, I'm noticing that they have far more access to the, the, the phone's capabilities than ever before. In fact, you can make a little uh, a little icon for that for the app on your home screen. Even though it's a it's a web app or a mm -hmm. web, it sits on a server, but you can treat it like a normal app. But that's a different uh, topic. So, but then yeah, but to to deploy the app as uh, on the app stores, uh, you know, as a uh, you know as an iPhone app or an Android app, you need to wrap it. There needs to be a wrapper. And the wrapper is what converts your HTML5 uh, application into a native mobile app. Actually, almost like a native, they call it hybrids. So they become mm -hmm. hybrid mobile apps. Now, one of these wrappers happens to be the Ionic framework. Now, the Ionic framework has become very big. It started around about, I think in the early 2010s, uh, it was developed in a hackathon 
actually developed in a hackathon and the developers, uh, they saw the potential for it. So they decided to take it forward and make a, make a complete business out of it. Right. So Ionic is an open source framework and it has lots of uh, documentation and there's tons of plugins. Now, why do you need plugins? The plugins are important when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to access some of the features of your device. For example, the local storage or the camera or the, the, the face ID or touch ID on your, on your device. So there's a lot of inbuilt features which you don't have to develop for anymore because mm -hmm. Ionic has the, uh, the plugins and they, 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 they keep it up to date. Um, it, it allows you to uh, connect to remote APIs with JavaScript super 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 cool i love that i just love that i don't know why i never cease to get the thrill of a front end mobile application talking to a server on the back end and sending and receiving information but that's a thing i i just yeah. love that now so so uh ionic is super powerful it has it also has lots of by the way lots of um um, lots of front end elements that can actually make your app look like a native app. That's very important. So, you know, buttons and screens and different, uh, different uh, controls, these all, uh, I mean, if you look at iOS and you look at Android, they're quite different. Mm -hmm. But Ionic gives you uh, templates that actually uh, enable you to make your apps look like, like native apps. Um, Ionic is lightweight. It's, it's very, yeah. very lightweight. Now lightweight is that, important. Yeah, yeah that, that's one of my, one of my uh, other things that I love most about Ionic uh, is that it's, you've got this incredibly powerful package, but it runs extreme with, with extremely little resources it's extremely lightweight so even older phones will have no problem running an, an ionic app that's very important and not just older phones but i mean the the bulk of the world's population are using very entry-level android devices with extremely mm -hmm. limited um, uh, resources on those on those devices i mean if you look at yeah. some of the the phones that we that you know that some of our sponsors give give to the our youth those are very entry level devices so when you mm -hmm. are developing remember as a, as an app developer you are not developing for the iphone 14s those are powerhouses those are more powerful than most laptops also mm -hmm. and yeah you're developing for the low end phones you're testing there yeah and it's it's so, important to to remember also that i mean even for the the heavyweight champions in in terms of of mobile processing power like your iphone 14s and the latest galaxy tablets the heavier the app runs the more battery life it's going to be consuming so even the the, the most advanced phones are going to feel a pinch if if your app isn't optimized well. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it's gonna, and it's gonna become frustrating and what's gonna happen? Your clients or your customers or your users are just gonna un, uninstall your app and forget about it. And that's a disaster. Um, yeah. So here's something interesting. There's two interesting things about Ionic, right? In the old days, Ionic was strictly uh, tied in with Angular the JavaScript framework, the Angular framework. Uh, you, you guys can go and have a look at that one. Uh, but in the more recent years, they've made it more flexible. So you can you can build uh, using React, Vue.js, or Angular. These are all JavaScript frameworks. So Ionic's given you um, flexibility there, which is great. But here's another interesting thing about Ionic. In the old days, in the old days, when I was when I first started developing, Ionic would be the framework to develop your your mobile app. It would give you all of the the, the capabilities to develop your your cross platform app, but it wasn't a wrapper. 
You couldn't wrap an app with it. Mm. You needed another wrapper to wrap the app. So here you've got this app on your device, on your app, on your on your on your computer, but to deploy it, you needed a wrapper. And that wrapper that I used back in the days was Apache Cordova, which incidentally is second on your list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's, let's so, jump into that one. So I mean, um, just just to simplify it um, for for those who are, who are still not understanding what what this wrapper is. Um, you should be fairly uh, familiar with what, what uh, a programming language is. Um, so think about it like this. This is, <laughs> it's not a very accurate representation, but it's, it should give you an idea of what, what this wrapper is. Um, so iPhones and Androids have a specific language that they understand, right? So for iOS, it's Swift, and for um, Android, it's, it's Java. Um, and so to effectively talk to those devices, you've got to communicate to them in their respective languages. Um, but that's not always ideal because then you, you as a person are going to have to learn those and develop two different apps. So what you do is you develop your app in HTML5 and then you use one of these frameworks, either Ionic or Cordova, as a, a translator in a way that breaks down your your app that you wrote in one language into code that the the device you're deploying it to can run or you know wrapping it in a, in a yeah <laughs> basically just wrapping it in a way so that the phone can understand it and decipher it properly so you can develop it once and then translate it to work on just about any device um yeah and that brings us to our our second um a framework on, on this list, I, I which just, is... I just, wanna, I just wanna pause you on that one because that's a very important point that we missed at the start of this conversation. Why, why is, actually this is a whole topic. I did, a, I, I do, a, I do lectures at, at university on this. Why mm. is cross-platform great? That's, that's important. And it's simply because if you're gonna write native apps for iOS and a native app for Android, you're gonna take the same app and you're gonna write it twice. You're going to mm. build it twice. Why? When you can use HTML5 and build one app that runs on both. So that, that's important. But we can unpack that in another conversation. Let's get down to Apache. Cordova. Apache. So, yeah, this, this uh, Apache was previously known as, as PhoneGap. Um, and I think many, many of our university students would be familiar with PhoneGap. Uh, and you know, just like Ionic, Apache has been around for a long, long time and has changed a lot since um, since uh, you know it first released. Um, and just like Ionic, it's it's open source, meaning the community is constantly uh, developing it, is constantly adding to its um, you know the, the online resources and the documentation. And I think compared to Ionic, Apache is a lot easier to, to set up and get going. They have this command line interface and you just type in a few lines of, of, of code in your, a single line of code in your command prompt, or you can just copy it and paste it from uh, Apache's homepage, their, their website's homepage, and boom, you have this entire environment set up and, and ready to go. Yeah, I, 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 I like Apache Cordova because it gives you flexibility, even more flexibility. Why? Because you can, you, see, you can write and create an app in pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript without any framework. Let's say you don't want a framework okay. or a library. You don't want to use Angular. You don't want to use React, as good as they are. But you are... Let's say you are a pure JavaScript developer and you're not familiar with those libraries or you just got an app that's already just built in, in pure uh, JavaScript. You can use Apache to wrap that app. And it also, like you say, it has all the libraries to give you access into camera, VP, GPS, vibration, uh, um, security features, etc. built in. So you, you, don't need to, you don't need to use a framework if you don't want to use a framework. Otherwise, 
if you are doing ionic or you're using react native you don't need cordova right because those mm -hmm. have their own wrappers they have their own wrappers built in so you 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 you, you don't need those but if you're writing pure it doesn't even make sense because you rather use ionics or react native's own own wrapper because that will give you the, the ultimate performance but if you want to write your html css javascript no framework no libraries use just use cordova yeah, and uh, yeah i mean that's that's probably the the easiest way to to wrap your apps right right and yeah, that's, that's one of the advantages of, of Cordova. Um, and I think one of the other things I like about Cordova specifically is um, it's very modular in, in how, how it works. So just like with Ionic, it allows you to access your, your device's hardware uh, and your local device's local APIs, like the camera or the GPS or the, the vibrate um, feature which you know would be very handy when you um, when you're developing an app but not every app is going to use every one of those those features um, so there's no there's no reason why you need to include those the, the code for those in every one of your app and so um, Cordova allows you to only import the features that you need uh, and you know just like with setting up the whole thing it's all done in the command line if you want to add a uh, the, the the api for the camera for example copy this code from their website paste it in your command line click enter and it imports it for you oh, so just yeah, like that yeah. you, you only import what you need so you make sure again that your your app stays lightweight and efficient in the way it runs yeah now that's that's uh, i mean that's that's great about cordova and that's one reason that I, I think Cordova has remained relevant because I, in my opinion, it's the lightest of all these, uh, these frameworks. Okay, let's mm -hmm. go on to the next one. We are running out of time. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, we, we've got a few questions today. Um, Let, let's go to the questions. That's more important. Cool, so yeah, um, I am Rambo. <laughs> I am Rambo is, is a regular. We, we've got okay. I Rambo every day. So he says, um, why is Japan so advanced compared to us? Do they have more coders and programmers or are they just more hardworking? That's a uh, good question. So I mean, I it's not, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, although he was asking specifically about Japan, but it, it applies for, you know, all countries, you know, like Turkey or countries in, in Europe. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at India, okay, let's, let's use a more recent example, right? Uh, I mean, Japan has been a uh, thriving economy for you know, decades now, but let's look at one that's actually two. Let's look at two. One a little, little older, and that is Bangladesh. Three decades ago, Bangladesh was an absolutely poor country. How did they become such an advanced country now? And that's simply because they focused on the youth and they focused on technology. They knew that they, they have to get onto the technology uh, bandwagon, the fourth industrial revolution, the gig economy. And it's one thing I keep saying that Bangladesh has 400,000 IT freelancers, people that are doing freelance work, working from home, working in, in from villages and rural areas and towns and cities and the servicing countries around the globe. But remember, it started off with a focus on the youth and getting them empowered with technology, which is exactly what IT Varsity is doing. Another good example, much more recent in Africa is Rwanda. Rwanda is another mm -hmm. country that um, put a strong emphasis on tech, uh, a strong emphasis on, uh, on the youth and on training up the youth and assisting them to start up uh, businesses. And they ran with it. And that's how those economies became very strong. It wasn't driven entirely by the government. It was a it was a hand in hand thing. The, the youth worked. The government assisted the youth. The youth worked to build up these businesses and to build up freelance work. And they they just grew with it. They just grew and grew and grew. And I think what everybody's waiting for. And South Africa is like this like this. Uh, 
how do I put it? It's like this, um, it's ready to pop with, with possibilities because it's, it, we've got such a young population, such a brilliant young population. Uh, and, you know, just, mm-hmm. just to judge some of the students we've worked with, they, they are amazing. All it needs is that one push and they will do well. And iDiversity is trying to give, give that push. Okay, next question. Cool. So we have another, a question from Jeff Lee Pretorius who says, will South Africa ever become well-versed in technology uh, now that load shedding has become a huge factor in our lives? I think that's a, 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 a um, it, 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 it builds on from, from what you were saying. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think we got a lot of challenges, uh, but I'm, I'm one of those optimists. I think we'll get over this load shedding problem. Uh, there, there is technology out there to, to alleviate this problem within a couple of years. It doesn't have to take long. I think as South Africans, uh, this is something we need to do. We are good people. We are great people as South Africans, but we, say, we tend to be a uh, bit on the passive side. What we need to do is to put pressure on our government, legal pressure. I'm not saying go and start doing terrible things. I'm saying legal pressure. Put pressure right from local to national government and say, we've had enough of this shit. We had, we've had enough of this and we need a change. And one of the big changes we need is privatization of, uh, or the, 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 the license for private firms to become power generators. That's one of the biggest obstacles. I mean, there are a number of, of companies that are ready to go with solar power and, and a whole lot of different types of power, but they're just waiting for permission from the government to, to move ahead. I promise you, once that happens, we'll have constant power, we'll have clean power, and we'll have cheaper power than ever before because it's not just one uh, controller. So I think hang in there. Uh, that's my first yeah, advice. Hang in there, be positive, we'll get over this. The second thing is, you know, I've, I've got a brother who owns a factory and when load shedding hits them, load shedding hits them. There's nothing they can do. Mm. It's too expensive to run generators. But for us in the IT sector, it's so easy. You just buy a power brick and you are in business. And this is something I don't understand. I speak to a lot of people who are in the tech space and they say, well, yeah, I've got load shedding, blah, blah, blah. So what? In my Mm. office, my Wi-Fi router, which is the core of my business operations, has a backup power and a backup of the backup power also. So when load shedding go- comes in, that thing, that thing kicks in instantly and we never lose internet connectivity. My devices are all, always charged. My power banks are always fully charged. So where's the problem? We are the most fortunate in the IT sector. We can continue working when everybody else has to shut down. And that's very, very important. So I hope that answers the question. Oh, any more questions? I love these questions. Uh, uh, one more question from I am Rambo. Uh, oh, first, I am Rambo says, Congratulations on your trip. Hope you have a, a safe trip back home. Thank you. Thank you, I am Rambo. Um, I mean, as lovely as it is here, you do start to, to miss the comforts of home after a while. <laughs> and then I am Rambo says, According to you, is South Africa falling behind in terms of technology? South Africa is not falling behind. South Africa's youth are falling behind. If you guys, you guys who are who are sitting here listening to this, my advice to you is focus on yourself. Focus on your own growth. Learn. If you haven't uh, studied tech, study tech. Go to IT Varsity's website. There's free courses. Go and learn. Advance yourself. You need to be the change. The country is not going to change you. You are going to change the country. And that's something I always say. South Africa's youth are what's going to change this country, is what's going to take it forward. All right. They are the ones that need to become tomorrow's entrepreneurs and tomorrow's politicians and tomorrow's decision makers because they they are they are forward thinking. You know, just from the questions that we are getting here, mm-hmm. it shows where our youth are in their thinking. And if I could do any one thing, I would mobilize South Africa's youth to become tech geniuses, tech wizards, tech entrepreneurs, and to get into every facet of the country, every industry, including government, and make the change from the top. It's time. Look, 
I mean, I guess, yeah, that, that, that's the, the, uh, the shadow, the, the evil motive of, of IT varsity. We're not just here to, to teach technology uh, and, and coding skills to, to people. We're here to, to mobilize a force like the world has never, right. never seen before. <laughs> yeah, mobilize the people. To... We fought apartheid. Now we fight poverty. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to fight we, to make us number yeah. one in Africa. Yeah, we, we drive South Africa into, into the future. Uh, no more relying on, on others to do that for us. That's it. I mean, we're not political because mm -hmm. despite our surname, the Katrada surname and, you know, Ahmed Katrada, Kati, we don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know the first thing about politics, but I know something about the power of youth. I know the, 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 the power of young people to drive change. And if you look at it the world over, uh, most of the governments are old people. I mean, look at Joe Biden. That guy is a mm -hmm. fossil, right? But he's a president. <laughs> you look at our government also, mostly old people. Would you respect to them? You know, I have a lot of respect for our government. But where's the young people? How about we get a late 30s, early 40s president in South Africa? Somebody who's a tech guru also, who knows what, what, uh, what's needed in the tech world. I wish for something like that. And I know that one of them, one of them is going to be uh, coming up soon and that will be an IT varsity graduate, will be the president of this country. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we, we're actually over time now. We haven't even discussed all of our, our um, frameworks that we've had, which is just as well. Um, I don't like to, to rush these things. Um, you know, I, I like to give as much value as we could. So if that means splitting it into, into future webinars, then by all means. Um, yeah. yeah, I think let's, really... do a, let's, let's do a whole, whole episode on React because at mm -hmm. present, React is my favorite because mm -hmm. of the ease of learning, because of the, the lightweight part of it and because of React Native, which allows you to create mobile apps. I think it deserves its own episode. Absolutely. So yeah, we'll add that to the pipeline. So within the next few weeks, look forward to that. Um, we'll do a whole episode just on what makes React so, so incredible. Um, but other than that, yeah, guys, thank you so, so much for, for joining us again. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, and don't forget, leave your comments uh, under these, these videos, even after the webinar is done. Uh, the videos go live on our YouTube channel, so you can comment there as well if you have anything to add or any questions. Let us know what you think, or and and yeah, we'll 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 get back to you. Or what you want to know about what we can what we can discuss. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Thanks exactly. so much, guys. Cool. <laughs> and we'll see you next week.